Um, my name is Sandy Golding, and I'm president of the Beaches Watch. Thank you guys for coming tonight. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with Beaches Watch, we are a nonprofit citizens group. We are a 501c4, and um, our focus is educating and involving citizens in the issues that come before our beaches communities. And one of the ways we educate is through our monthly meetings and through programs like this one. And so tonight's meeting is educational, is an educational program for, the, for candidates. Anybody who's considering running for office, and we have the Atlantic Beach elections coming up um, August 27th, is that correct? And uh, Beaches Watch will be having a candidate forum on Wednesday, August 14th at the Atlantic Beach Elementary School at 7 o'clock. Um, and for those of you that have filed and are running for the Atlantic Beach seats, we will also be sending you some information about questions, written questions that we'll have the candidates answer in writing. And then we put the responses on our website so that um, voters can go to our website and learn a little bit more. And also we'll get um, like links to your websites and that sort of thing so we can put that on there as well. So anyway, um, just the dates that you need to know, August 14th, Wednesday, August 14th, the candidate form at the Atlantic Beach Elementary School. And I hope everybody can plan to make it. We'll talk about, we'll talk about um, seven o'clock. Mm -hmm. we'll we'll yeah, that right. would be great. That would be great. And then let's see. Oh, and just one real quick plug. We are having our monthly, our July meeting on the 10th. Not, not the first Wednesday. Um, it's actually the second Wednesday because of the 4th of July holiday. And uh, it will be at Neptune Beach City Hall. And our topic is Beaches Budgets 101. And we're going to have all three of the city managers there, and they're going to be talking about their beaches, their beaches budgets, kind of giving citizens a little insight into what goes into the budgets, what goes into the process, and then, of course, answering questions because I think it's important for citizens to understand and be able to, to ask the city managers questions about our budgets before the budgets are approved. So. Um, that should be a great meeting, so I hope everybody can plan to attend. Now, if you, did everybody get handouts when you came in? Um, Supervisor of Elections brought handouts, which is great, so you can take those with you. We are recording this, so if for some reason you might have been confused or forgot something or whatever, we're going to have it posted um, on our Facebook page, so you can always um, go back and see the video again of the presentation. So um, so we'll go ahead and get started. We are very pleased and, and grateful because Jerry Holland's been, and Beth both, have been awesome. Every year they come out to the beach and do this training for us, and we really appreciate it. So I'd like to turn the floor over to Jerry Holland, who's our supervisor of elections, and Beth Lee, who is the director of candidates and records. Um, and I'll let you guys have a floor. Thank you. And I'll, I'll get Beth up here in a second. First, I kind of want to tell you a little bit about, and I know some of y'all might have been at our uh, candidates uh, workshop uh, at the Atlanta Beach Commission off, uh, offices. I uh, guess it was just City Clerk's office. City Clerk, just a few weeks ago. Chambers. 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 So, uh, but this is a little bit different. There are some things that you'll get a little bit different, and also we want to make sure that we reinforce some of the things too. Uh, there's a couple of things we're really kind of proud about this election is one we're going to we're working on getting electronic poll books for all precincts in the 2014 elections uh, which will eliminate the paper registers uh, they'll also we've done that before we do it in early voting we've done it as a test before but not online and in this election it will be online what does that mean it means for the candidates and for the public you will actually be able to go to our website and look to see who's voted so far that day. You know, instead of necessarily having to get that information from a poll watcher, or get that information, uh, that will be live data that will tell you who's voted that day. For this Let, election? For this election. Wahoo! Yes, Wahoo is right, because it's our chance to obviously see how it works on a live data thing. Uh, as my IT director, uh, you know, reinforced, it is technology, which works most of the time so we're you know but we're prepared to to make sure that you know we give you the the latest and greatest as we do this election 
and hopefully it'll be something that will work very well so that we can implement it on a countywide basis in 2014 when we come to the gubernatorial elections. Uh, but Beth will tell you a little more about that, but basically it'll be a website portal that you will be able to see who's voted, what the turnout is, by precinct. So it'll really give you some data that I think as a candidate or working on a campaign will really help you. If you've got supporters and you're looking to see have they voted yet, it'll be able to allow you to say, yes, they voted, so I don't need to make that phone call. But no, they haven't voted, so I need to make that phone call because they're one of my supporters. I want to make sure that you know they're okay, that they need a ride. And, and especially uh, when we're dealing with four precincts and a real what I love is elections where you're very hands-on, which you are very connected to community, be able to make that outreach during the election day. So we'll explain more of that as we go along. Uh, also, the purpose of this is one, as always, when we go out into the public, is anything we cover here is to make sure we do a good job of explaining anything we've got, but also the other election questions that you have to make sure that we answer those. Uh, our, our role, as far as what we consider a successful election, and a candidate, obviously, and I've been on that side of the, of the fence, a candidate considers a successful election of winning the election. We consider a successful election can be actually for both candidates, the winner and the loser. In the election mind, if you make it through the process, you followed all the election laws, you never get called down for not doing something that you're supposed to do or doing something else. And so our role is to really make sure that you know the laws, that you have the opportunity, that we're there to assist you from the standpoint of giving you whatever information you need and to make sure that you've got everything you know that you need from us as quickly as you can. Um, we're humans like anybody else. We can make mistakes. Sometimes our technology is not as quick. We had a situation not long ago where, again, on the districts, it took a while for the IT department because of redistricting to get those separated. All that's working now. Hopefully, you're tested too. Everything's good. Okay, we're all there. We tested too, but you're my you're my, my go-to person if I have a problem. So if you're good, I'm good. So as well as any other candidate. Uh, but again, I hope tonight will be something very helpful. Uh, I'm going to let, uh, you know, as you kind of go along in the supervisor role, you kind of, you know, bring people up in the office. Beth has done an excellent job of always dealing with our candidates, making everyone feel like they're 100% focused on whatever their needs are, and she's done a wonderful job of, of putting this presentation together. I'm here only if there comes that question that, as Beth would say, requires a higher pay grade to answer. I'm here to make sure that you can get the answer tonight, or at least the assurance that we'll get it to you as quickly as possible. So, uh, and if there's something I see, you know, to add to it, we do that sometimes. But I really want Beth to kind of, you know, fly solo here and, and give you this presentation, which she does an excellent job. Uh, before I turn it over to her, is there any questions that you have for me or anything on the elections? Uh, just a few things, just to let you know, there is no early voting in this election, as far as an early voting site. Uh, it's not mandatory in municipal elections, it's something only if if the city wants to do or something like that is an expense to the city. Um, obviously there's absentee voting. Uh, Beth will get into when the absentees are dropped, how many have so far requested in the portal, and all those information that you would get as you go along. But again, I think everything will be covered, but I will jump in as I always do, Beth, but I'm going to try to see if we just take this thing through it. So thank you all very much, and Beth, yeah, wait. We don't have a thank you.
from Atlantic Beaches to, to our website. So um, we should have both of those websites uh, bookmarked anyway. Thank you. Okay, we talked a little bit about absentee chasing, and the concept, the rationale is that once the absentees have been mailed out to the voters who requested absentee ballots, as a candidate, you want to send your literature to those households so that as they're getting their absentee ballot, they've got your information in their hands as they get ready to vote. It's a, it's a old, it's really kind of an old time concept, but it's still very, very much alive and well, and candidates use it. Um, uh, it's, uh, I would say that it's, it's an effective strategy, most definitely. Um, we have a, an absentee portal, as Jerry mentioned, and um, it's available. The, the statute only allows that information to be made available to candidates, political committees, and political parties. And so um, if you're not, if you're just a member of the public and you just would like to know who's, re who's requested an absentee ballot, that information is not accessible to you. The statute still protects that information for absentee requesters. Um, to participate in the portal, everybody, um, the candidates who are here know that it's a $50 fee. And I've received um, from three, three candidates so far. So I'm, I'm figuring the other three candidates may, may come forth. We'll be sending out an email uh, in a couple of days that'll, that'll recap everything you need to know about the portal, how to get in there, how to use it, and we'll have your password and your user code and all of that. So that's, that is coming. Uh, this, is a, this is a corrected, updated number. Um, the number that I provided a couple weeks ago, there was uh, an operator error when I went to pull the file, and I didn't realize that there were some other absentee requests in there. Uh, we break the absentees down into four categories. Military overseas, military domestic, civilian overseas, and then civilian domestic. So right now in our queue, we've got 678 requests from absent from Atlantic Beach voters for absentee ballot. So that's a pretty pretty substantial number for 10,000 10, voters, considering um, we just come off of a major election in November. Um, for our purposes, I think if we go to the next next one, um, this is the schedule. And on July 12th, we'll have our first drop, what we call our first mail drop of the, um, and it's the overseas, military, and civilian overseas. So it's both categories of military and civilian overseas. So you saw those numbers that we just had. There's not a lot overseas. The bulk, that 611, is the domestic. Okay, and then that first drop is scheduled for July 30th. As we get requests in, we then do them in onesies and twosies or in groups of 25, whatever it is, we send them out daily once we do that first mail drop. And um, the, um, for you to know, to tell the voters, to tell your supporters that the last day to request an absentee to be mailed is August 21st. And the last day that we can actually mail those absentees out is Friday, the 23rd of August. So those are really important dates that, that, your, that your supporters want to know. So you want to kind of have that somewhere so that you can share that information with them. Absentee ballots have to be um, picked up. Um, if someone wants to come by, they can't go by St. Paul. They have to come to our office to have it issued in our office. Otherwise, we mail them out, and we mail them out, obviously, to where they're not always the same address. We have several people already that have their requests in that are going to be out of town during, during the election season. So they've already got the requests in. Any questions about absentee? Yes. This is a concern. Yes. I've been absentee balloting for years, okay. and I didn't realize, except in the back of my mind, I read it somewhere that that uh, automatic wasn't automatic anymore. It lasts only a few years. And so luckily, I did call. And, and you I made your request. And I did request it. 
but I think they should be more publicity and not, not always on the computer, in your newspapers, on the radio, because uh, your senior citizens like me, that's where we read. Right. And, and you're right. In fact, the state law has changed a couple times. One time it was, it was uh, only a year. One time it was only until the next federal election. Uh, now it's through the next two federal elections. In other words, you can request right now through the elections of 2016. And so, and then whatever your request is now, it could be updated after 2014 to go through 2018, but it can only go up through the next two federal elections. And so it is something, well, what we try to do also is when we send absentee cards, uh, we'll put a absentee mailer request on that absentee card. The and voter, voter card. On the voter, voter card, voter I'm sorry. Yeah. On the voter card that you get for your voter registration card, uh, there'll be an absentee request. Uh, your suggestion will also work on, on future uh, sample ballots to make sure we put that language in there. Yeah. You know, but that's a good point because I think a lot of people, you know, and we get some people who think they're Will be there. <coughs> Is there any um, reason they couldn't vote at the polls if they had done the absentee? Because if they, if they were elected to and didn't get to it, can they go to the polls and vote? Absolutely. Yeah. The key is this, though. If you requested an absentee and you don't have it to surrender at the polls, okay, then we're going to probably have you vote provisional so that we can verify that an absentee has already come in. That would be the only key. Now, what we, if you bring it in to surrender, then we'll avoid that, give you a ballot, then go, you put it in the machine and everything's fine that day. Now with EBITs though, will that be a little bit of a different procedure? Well, we're hoping that with the electronic poll votes, we call them EBITs, which is electronic voter ID, uh, we're hoping with that process that we can eliminate that and then automatically negate your request. And so we'll be trying that. If, if it's possible, then it won't be the provisional, which is what we've done in the past if you didn't have your absentee to surrender we'll be able to negate it in the system and then go ahead and let you vote. But the bottom line of the question is, is if you don't want to vote the absentee, absolutely you can come to the polls and cast a ballot. Uh, one other thing, while, and I'll turn it back over to Beth, is especially when she was talking about turnout. And we're predicting for this election, or I am, about a 28% turnout for this election overall. But I will say, normally absentee requests are usually about you know, 20% more than whatever the average uh, election day turnouts. That's why people so critically request going after these people because they have made an effort to say, I want to vote in this election, mail me a ballot. So that's why candidates always go the extra mile and try to make sure they can get their literature or letter to these people because they're a higher percentage of voting than just the average voter that you see uh, coming in election day. Question. I have two adult kids that are overseas with the military, and so you mentioned that if they sign up once, that's good for two federal elections. What about local things when they're still, this is their home? They can still request absent, they, when you make that request, in fact, what you can do, you can either request for that election that you've got coming up, or you can request all elections through that time period. Okay. What you can't do is say today, is you can't go in and say, uh, I want the primary of 2014, but not the general, but then come to 2016, I want the general, but not the primary. So it's kind of, you're requesting for a specific election, or all elections, and that means anything that you're eligible to vote for, through that second federal election. And they go online to do that? Or? Uh, they can make a request online, that is possible to do that also, uh, you know, and, and get that system and do an absentee request online. We have a, we have a whole process for folks who are overseas and um, we have somebody who focuses strictly on, on the overseas and the military as far as fulfillment and I believe we're going to do the same thing that we do for all of our other elections where if somebody is in Afghanistan or wherever points you know uh, over that far away they have the, they can request their absentee it can be emailed to them and then they vote that ballot and then they they can fax it back or they can mail it back. Right. They can't email it. We're not, we haven't reached that. that, that well, the statute won't yet. allow that yet. So. We're not there yet, but um, I, don't, I don't know if we will be. But it, I think that we do a really, really good job of meeting the needs of those folks who are not at home. Mm -hmm. And because we have somebody, her name is Maggie Johnson, you can call our switchboard if you want to request those absentees. 
call our switchboard. You can ask for Maggie by name and Maggie Johnson, and that, that's her deal. That's what she does. She focuses on those ballots, and she does a great job. Great job. We take, we take care of our military. We really do. We're, we're, we, just, we, don't, we don't want to mess that up. It's too important. To be um, just so you know, this form is available on our website. It's a, um, it, it's a PDF. You can print it out. And if you are talking to um, voters and they say, well, I really would like to request an absentee ballot, this is the approved form for the office, for our office. This has all of the information that we need for you to bring to us or mail to us if you want. Or you can ask the person, I mean, if they don't want to go online and request and you're providing a service to help them request an absentee ballot, this is the form we'd like for you to use. Okay? And um, this is a, 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 a page of our um, website. And if you've been to the website, you've got these tabs. Voter status, register to vote, update registration, vote by mail, precinct finder. If you click on vote by mail, it's going to bring you to this window right here. And this is where you can tell the voter if they want to check to see if their request has, has been received by us. And then it will tell them the status of their absentee ballot as it goes through the process. So it's either, am I eligible to vote? But in this case, we want to track my ballot, which is your absentee ballot. Put in first name, put in last name, and then put birth date, and hit submit. And then you get, you get a status on that absentee ballot. I put my name in. I don't have one requested, obviously, at the limit of the speech. But if, there, if, if the request was in, there would be a different message there says your absentee ballot um, request has been received and then as it goes through the process the message changes so this is all on our website and you can drive people you know encourage them to go and visit you can do the same you can look somebody up and see if they request it um, let's see all right so i guess we're ready to go for the next one okay and as jerry already mentioned the municipality does not have to have early voting so we can Some reasons, and we've never had a problem at Atlanta Beach, but in other places within the county, 
is candidates feel because I'm special, I can go into a precinct and check on it to see how it's going, how many votes have been cast, you know, is everything going okay? You don't have any special privilege. You really don't. Uh, you have every right to come in there, you know, when you when you go in there to vote. Uh, we don't have a problem if a candidate brings their children in, you know, because they want to see the process. Uh, you can't take pictures in there because sometimes you'll see these things where even the president or somebody goes in and, and they want someone to come in and show them taking pictures of them voting. Statute says you cannot take photography inside a polling place, no, and no one's exempt from it as far as candidates or their family or anything like that. But this is just something that sometimes it comes up in other places, and we just want to enforce that is to make sure that you know, because that's one of those little things that you can stump your toe on where people go, well, I just saw the candidate, and they came in. This is not even their precinct, and they were inside, and that's one of those no-nos that you don't want someone saying, you know, someone's doing something wrong. Okay, so that kind of blends in now to political signage, and I've got all three kind of beaches uh, communities here, but obviously we want to focus on Grand Beach. Is there anybody, is there a candidate here that doesn't know the sign ordinance for Grand Beach at this point? Okay, okay, you, you've been aware of it? Yes. I have a question about yeah. the sign. Um, so commercial property, um, are there any specific regulations on commercial properties? You must have the owner of the commercial property's permission. Yeah. That helps because okay. otherwise you're, you're violating that. But from our understandings of that, uh, along you're not on the right of way, and that becomes a confusing thing no matter where it is in the county going the whole elections, is that usually it's hard to distinguish sometimes, especially on commercial property, where does their property start and where does it the right of way. We usually say if there's a sidewalk, it'll always be on the inside, meaning the inside between the sidewalk and the commercial building. Uh, not between the sidewalk and the road. That's a good way to distinguish. If there's power lines, typically it's inside the power lines to the building because typically power lines and sidewalks will be on right of ways. And so that's that's part of you know helpful when you're trying to figure out where to put that sign. And just just a word to make it easier. Uh, if you see like a, a manhole cover or a J8 power thing, that's the reason why we have easements so they can do that stuff. So if you put it just beyond there, you're usually yeah, and, and usually beyond their inside the door of the commercial building yeah. is what you want to do. Exactly. Now, I will say, Jack, the city of Jacksonville, we tightened up our ordinance on signs, uh, political signage, uh, a couple of years ago. And um, and I don't think that it really. It doesn't affect that. I mean, your, your, your ordinance is your ordinance. And, um, um, you know, you'll hear about it if, if you're in violation. And I do know that. that uh, the, the um, city hall is they're not there's not going to be a lot of forgiveness with signage if your signs are not where they're supposed to be they're not going to pull them out of the ground and hold them for you and call you and let you know that your signs are you know have been captured they're just going to toss them so you really want to be sure that you that you and you tell your your supporters and people who are helping with your campaign where signs can be because ultimately it's your responsibility I don't know about signs. I don't know where, where that stands in Atlantic Beach, but just just word for the wise. You know, put them where they're supposed to be. Don't put them where they're not supposed to be. And the most valuable sign place is in somebody's yard. I mean, Absolutely. because what that represents is someone who supports you. And that, you know, when you're driving into a neighborhood and you're seeing something, you see signs, you say, wow, that one, that one, that one supports me, or, you know, those kind of things. So even though it's good to have commercial because it's usually on higher uh, traffic areas, it's those signs that are in people's yards that really mean something. So, uh, if you're focused on having limited signs, I'd always say focus on your on your neighbors and see if they can put a sign, you know, in their yard. When you when, when you see signs kind of gathered up in the median, median um, and because somebody sees it and somebody else puts it, and they just say, "Well, I'll put my sign over because everybody else is too." It makes the voters angry. And if you, you know, think back to 2012 where we had an explosion of signs everywhere. Voters will sometimes call us complaining about the signage and say, I'm not voting for that candidate now because I'm sick of seeing his signs or her signs everywhere. So it does make an impression, and it's not the greatest impression either. So. Is there also a limit on the number of signs you can have on property? Um, I'm Beach? not sure in Atlantic yeah. Beach. Uh, Carolyn is saying she doesn't think so. No, in Jacksonville, no. city of Jacksonville, it's two signs per property. So we really tightened it up a lot. We used to have the two sign rule, and 
Somehow it just disappeared out of the code. Wow. Oh. <laughs> okay, poll watchers, um, we may have mentioned it just briefly, and poll watchers are people who are interested in the process, they want to help a candidate um, be the eyes and the ears in the polling location on election day, and um, the deadline to designate those poll watchers, and they have to be Duval County voters, and it's August 13th. So if you're gonna, if, even if you just wanna have one poll watcher or two people to be available to you throughout the course of the day, to check into the precinct, make sure things are going smoothly, they can go over, they can check the, um, the, the OSX and see how many, how many votes have, have um, been clocked in that day. It's your eyes and ears out in the field, so to speak, on, on election day. Yes. So the poll watcher is not designated to one specific. Does poll. not have to be. Yeah. Uh, and poll watchers also the, the kind of jurisdiction of uh, if they're doing something wrong and can they stay is it falls under mine. And so basically they will wear a sign that says I'm a poll watcher and I cannot talk to you because they're not allowed to talk to the voters. They're not allowed to carry on or, or answer questions. They're there to watch. It's supposed to be eyes and ears, not mouth. And so. If the if poll watcher says, wow, I don't want to talk to them, then technically you have to go outside the precinct before you make contact. If for some reason you felt like, I want to get more information from that voter, uh, what was your problem, I saw you having difficulty or something like that, you, you can engage them outside the precinct, but not inside. You get one warning in Duval County if you're a poll watcher and you violate the rules of a poll watcher. You get one warning. Second one, you're now no longer a poll watcher in that election. And so we remove your badge, you know, brand new, throw you outside. And so, but more, normally, most people know that we're very strict on it. You get that one morning, and we have, we have the best poll watchers. So, and typically in a countywide election, we only lose one or two. Yeah. You know, we had in 2012 how many poll watchers? Over a thousand. Oh yeah, we were. Yeah. We were up so that's not a bad average. Yeah. Our poll watchers, we think, are pretty respectful. Convince me if I'm on the office why I would need a poll watcher. What is my poll watcher going to do for me? Well, what, what I think what a poll watcher, and especially, uh, you know, the history of poll watchers in the sense of what they're there for, is just like what I kind of warned, a candidate can't go in there. But I can tell you as a candidate, you want to know constantly, you know, what's going on. Now, if we've got the live data on the yeah. website and everything's there, it's really going to take away what poll watchers used to do in the past, which is they would go to the register, and you would know in that precinct, you may have a list of the supporters that you're looking for. And when it's not, no one's at the register, you can ask to say, hey, has Mrs. Smith come in yet? And she hasn't yet. And then you go outside and say, you know, Mrs. Smith hadn't come in yet, you, may, you need to call her. And so they were kind of checking who's voted so far. They also checked the count on the machine to say how many people have voted. So they were giving data that you couldn't just walk in off the street and get. But now, if everything works well on the electronic poll books, really all that data is going to be available to you at home on the computer. Uh, but there still can be there. As we said, we love in elections to have as many eyes and ears watching us. We're not a, we're not a closed operation and we don't want to see you know, what we're doing. So the public perception is we like to have poll watchers who are there to make sure, are they asking for IDs? Are people having problems voting? Are there anyone being turned away? You know, so they're watching us to make sure we're doing our job right. Uh, from a standpoint of, you know, is it necessary? Is it required? No, not all candidates do it. But it, from our standpoint, we encourage it if you have any concerns or you want any other data that you may not feel you're going to get, you know, uh, unless you have someone there. Always realize this, before the polls open, before we open the polls, when we're setting up, Anyone can be in the precinct, limited to how many people we can get in to watch us set up. They can't ask questions because we're on a time schedule to get it open by 7 o'clock. But it is technically opened up for cameras, media, anyone to watch a precinct set up. It is also after the last voter has voted at 7 o'clock, until the last voter has voted, walked out the door. Then the public's also allowed in that precinct to watch it close down. Because everything again is not to hide anything and everyone see the process. But that's, that's what we believe the logic behind poll watchers. And again, just our invitation, anyone who wants to have it, we've never discouraged it. And if you go to our website, there's a page dedicated to poll watchers, all the information.
information you need, the deadlines, the forms you have to fill out when they're due. Um, so again, on the website if you need it. Okay, a big, a big topic with um, municipal elections is it's a nonpartisan election. And we always have questions about what can you do when it's nonpartisan? What are you allowed to do? What are you not allowed to do? And so I've compiled several slides that just have, it's really just a listing of the things that you want to be aware of and thinking about as you go about your way in campaigning. And um, obviously, the nonpartisan offices, when you do not use your, poli your political affiliation in your campaign, it's nonpartisan. So we'll go to that. And then, um, What's interesting is the law allows you to list political affiliation somewhere in your, if you do a palm card, I always like to just imagine a palm card where your picture's on the front and your information about, you know, vote for me, and this is the election day, and all that good stuff, and your political disclaimer, we'll talk about that in a minute, we'll reiterate that, and you flip it over to the back, and on the back, you list all of the associations you're involved in, all of the Beaches Watch that you're involved in, whatever it might be. And if you happen to be uh, a member of one of the political parties, one of those executive committees, or whatever, you can list that on that palm card. Okay? So or if you belong to the Beaches Democratic Club, you can say a member of the Beaches Democratic Club. Or a member of the, of the person. First Coast Republican Club. You know, because again, it, it is allowed to show your affiliation to memberships of an experience. Of, yes, experience. An experience. Yes. If you're the treasurer, you're the something of a club like that. It is okay to do that. So, and Jerry does a good job of explaining this. So, if somebody comes up to you, or you knock on somebody's door, and you're canvassing a neighborhood, and the first thing the person says to you is, "What is your party affiliation?" And you, as a candidate, might say, "Well." <laughs> What I would advise you per se is this is a nonpartisan election. I'm running nonpartisan, uh, but I am registered as XYZ. All that is what I've just said is the proper legal response to what you're saying. Because there are people that will ask, what, yeah, you know, and, and I know that from past experience in other races like school board and you know, judicial is a little bit different, but, but from that standpoint, they want to know your party. And, and it's a public record also. Someone can call our office and say, can you tell me the party of such and such candidate or such and such voter? voter? That is public information. So you are allowed. But what you don't do is knock on the door and say, hi, I'm Bob Smith, and I'm running for uh, commission C, and I'm a Republican, and I'm a conservative, and, you know, and all these things. And you're leading out that you're a party you know, affiliation. That's what you can't because it's nonpartisan. But again, you can answer that. Now, in your brochure, if you believe you know, that you're aligning yourself with being a conservative or a fiscal conservative or, or, or that you're whatever, you can use all that terminology. You know, it's just you don't want to put up there, you know, for mayor, Republican so-and-so, Democrat so-and-so, because again, it's nonpartisan. And, and believe me, that's usually the questions we would get more than anything else is those things in a municipal nonpartisan election. And I'll usually get the phone call from somebody, one or two people who will call and want to know party affiliations for all candidates. Um, I've had people call me and want to know party affiliations for, for judicial candidates. Again, it's public record. Um, but um, you can push, push things in. But the point is, you don't want to have that positioned on your political advertising Other than again, if you're associating with a membership of a certain club, or you're a uh, Republican executive club member, a committee member, uh, precinct committee person, those are positions okay. that you hold. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay, so a couple of other things. A political party can contribute to a nonpartisan candidate in, in a nonpartisan race. Um, representatives from a political party can actively campaign. They can wave signs, they can make phone calls, they can um, put your literature at their headquarters if, if they have a headquarters. And 
sign, we used to get the call on nonpartisan candidates. Well, I see such and such nonpartisan candidates sign in front of such and such headquarters. As long as it doesn't say Republican on that sign, it can be sitting in the yard of that headquarters. Yeah, and people, we always get a call on that. Um, and so as a nonpartisan candidate, you can also participate in partisan activities. Um, you can endorse another candidate. Speeches on behalf of another. You can purchase um, with campaign funds a ticket to a political party event, and you can make contributions to a political party with personal funds. With your personal funds, if you want to write a check to a uh, political party, and uh, as long as it's personal funds, that's fine. It's, it's, it's not a violation of it. Um, you can also accept those contributions from the party. You solicit from the party. Um, you can keep, if you are a precinct committee person, you don't have to quit your position while you're running, while you're campaigning. Um, if you, um, if the political party that you're affiliated with wants to help you with mailings, for example, or, or whatever it might be, you could write a, an expense check, a campaign expense check to that party. And two things that come up also is, if the party wants to use a phone bank and call and say, I'm calling from such and such political party or from the, uh, the this uh, political party's you know, special one at the beaches or something of that nature, they can do that. Um, and we'll get that sometimes, you know, where they're calling and they'll say, well, I just had, you know, this political party call me and ask me to vote for this candidate. Yes, they can do that. And so that, but we get that call every time. And also, a lot of people say, for example, say the First Coast Republican Club has uh, an opportunity that they want any of the candidates who are Republicans to speak at. They do not have to have any candidates who are Democrats speak at. It's not there, and same with the Democratic Party. Uh, Beaches uh, Club doesn't have to, if they're having an opportunity for their members to hear those candidates who are Democrats speak, they do not have to, to have the Republicans come. And so, and usually we'll get that question sometime of, well, they didn't mind the other candidate come. These clubs, can totally do what they want to on this. Um, you mentioned political phone calls that we get a lot of, even in government. How do you get on all do not call? There is not. Uh, in state that statute, so I, well, it's talk to you, talk to you, state so representatives, your state senator, your state representative, because they are exempt from the do not call list, the political calls. You know, and, uh, and they know it too, and that's why you get those calls. And we tell people, you know, you're just offending people. You know, but, but they do it every time, and that's one of our number one complaints also. On the very first slide, you put, you put up there, I think y'all mentioned the demographics. And you said those are available? Yes. I mean, you know, what demographics? Is it, is it going to tell me that 75% of the people that voted in the last election are affiliated with this party? Oh, if you want data? Are you talking about the Yeah, data? Data, demographics. The things that we know about a voter that we can tell you is uh, their age grouping. You know what, what their age. So we can tell you uh, voter turnout by age. Uh, we can tell you uh, anything in reference to, to sex, male, female, FBC, voter turnout, FBC. anything. F, uh, it's it's listed as uh, white, black, Hispanic, and other on the uh, ethnicity of those and political party. Uh, so if you want any demographics of going, basically, if you want to know in a subdivision. I want to go walk and speak to just this political party, or I want to uh, direct this mailing to those over 60, uh, or I want to go after just this ethnic group for this particular mailing. All those demographics, we can pull voters just in those groups. I want, as we've talked before, I want those who vote, uh, you know, that's been registered since the last 10 years, who's voted in every Atlantic Beach election. Because the probability is they voted in the last 10 years in every Atlanta Beach election. Guess what? They're going to vote in this Atlanta Beach election. You know, but they won't include everyone who's going to vote in Atlanta Beach election. But you can kind of do that demographics based on how many times they voted, when they voted, what races they voted on, and all those other demographics. We can tailor anything from the entire city to a precinct to, uh, to a neighborhood, anything of those kind of demographics. Um, okay, so a candidate may not contribute to a political party fund from campaign account until the, the election cycle is over and you have remaining funds. Okay, so up until that election cycle is finished, you cannot write a campaign check 
to the party of which you're affiliated. Uh, the other thing um, to remember is, obviously, you can't contribute to a certain group or organization to get an endorsement from that group. That's, that's, that's a no-no. So, okay. Um, display, did, were there any other questions about nonpartisan campaigning? If you hang on to this list, if somebody, you know, questions you about something you're doing, you can pull out the list and say, these are the things I can do. These are the things I shouldn't be doing. Okay. Um, disclaimers. This is, disclaimers are my pet peeve. And I will look at a sign. I will zero in on a uh, piece of campaign literature. Um, I will look at a website. Um, and I'm always looking for the political disclaimer. And um, kind of, I, there's a format for the disclaimer, and there's also a format for, for advocating that you vote for somebody. And it's really vote for the name of the person and what they're running for. And sometimes people use um, uh, elect, elect or keep. vote, or some pot, or, or let's, well, let's keep is also would be for an incumbent. Um, an incumbent candidate does not have to put the word for on their advertising, okay? Um, and this is all in the, the campaign handbook, so the candidates are in the room who had a chance to really read through that, they know what I'm talking about. Um, anyway, the disclaimer has to be there on any paid advertising. Anything that you can One thing about the disclaimer also, because people often ask, how big does it have to be? It has to be readable, but if you, for example, if that was your sign, you'd say, well, I can read that sign from back there, does it mean I can read the disclaimer from back there? No, if I come up to the sign and I can read the disclaimer. So in other words, you could have a, the sign in the legal lot size, but the disclaimer is this big, but when you come up and you read it, that's all that's required. It's when they go up to the sign that they can find a disclaimer and say who's paid for it, you know, and who, you know, what seat is it for in case for somebody to have a question. But that's all that's required size-wise. Because I'll get some people saying, well, do I have to be able to see the disclaimer as big as the name of the candidate? That is true. The statute and people always well, does it is there is the font is the font you know mentioned in the statute? They're, they ask all those questions, and I always say to people, you know, why do you want it to be so small that nobody can see it? I mean, obviously, if you've gone to the trouble of printing, you spent money on signs, you know, you want people to know that, that you pay for it, you approve it. So um, I'm always looking for disclaimers. So if I see your if I see your material and I don't see a disclaimer, don't go to press until you've until somebody's looked at it. Because not all the printers know that that disclaimer needs to be there. It's up to you to be sure that it's there. Yes. So an incumbent can use the word keep, but uh, somebody that hasn't can't. Right. If you're not the incumbent, you can't say let's keep Bob Smith. You know you can't. Uh, an what? incumbent though can say uh, vote for Bob Smith or mayor. Yeah. An incumbent can still use the word FOR, but uh, someone who's not an incumbent can't remove the words FOR. That's the only restriction between the two. And then you can't, and from the standpoint of let's keep or let's reelect, then obviously only the incumbent can use terminology because what they're looking for is they do not want to in any way imply that a person who's not the incumbent is an incumbent. You know, and so that's where they're looking for. Although, the person who is an incumbent doesn't have to necessarily identify themselves as the incumbent. You know, that's the difference between the two. Because I, in another race, I think it was in Jack's Beach, we had an incumbent who I, uh, I don't want to put let's keep because they want to get rid of everybody and I, I don't want to identify as an incumbent. And if you remember, so he said, can I put four? Or can I say, you know, let's elect in four. I, and, and sometimes an incumbent actually will use the signs they first used. You know, it's perfectly legal to do that for an incumbent. Um, the other thing is, um, if you have a fundraiser, you do need to and you print tickets and all the things that go with the fundraiser. Um, you do need to put the disclaimer. Oh, you don't need the disclaimer, and the law has changed again. But we don't need to worry about it in this election. They took it away, and now they've added it back in. For some reason, somebody, one of uh, uh, some legislature <laughs> decided that. Need to put that on the There's quite a few legislative changes that won't go into effect until November 1st. 
So we don't want to confuse you too much on the new ones. So you don't need it. Right now you don't need it. Um, okay. Items that are designed to be worn, hats, t-shirts, all of that kind of stuff, novelty items under $10 value don't have to have the display. Okay. Um, paid link, um, the little boxes, the little Google ads, the little Yahoo ads, you don't have to have a disclaimer on that little box. But when you click on the box and you go wherever that final destination is, then you do have to have a disclaimer there. Okay. Obviously, those, those little ads, there's not enough room to put a full-blown disclaimer, and so that's why the statute is there. Um, next. All right. Um, blogs. We had, we had a candidate uh, in the, the fall election cycle who had a, a very prominent blog and did all of his advertising and all of his communicating. Um, he was a, a, a school board candidate. And, um, you don't have to put a disclaimer on a blog because a blog in and of itself, there's not cost associated with that. There's not cost to go to the blog. There's not cost to produce it. He did sort of, there were some questions about some of the stuff that did start appearing on the blog, whether or not it wasn't, and if we had to answer the question, that it wasn't paid political advertising on a blog. So if you do a blog and you want to communicate um, that way, you don't need a disclaimer. Um, Facebook, YouTube, again, you don't need to have a disclaimer on those, on that social media. However, you do need to have a statement, something to the effect of saying, this is the official Facebook page of such and such candidate. All information has been approved or authorized by the candidate. Um, it's just a good thing to do to put that there, yes. When it comes to the website, um, what if it's a website uh that's a free website. So there are blogs that you can have now that look like websites mm -hmm. that you don't pay for. You still need a disclaimer on a website that there is no fee associated with it? No, if it's not paid expression, and that's the, that's the clue. It's got to be paid expression. However, a website, and that's a really good question, but a website that there's cost associated with it, there's domain charges, there's all kinds of things associated with a website. If you have a Facebook page and you don't have a disclaimer on the Facebook page, Facebook page says visit my website where you can donate and do all the things you want to do for a campaign, there has to be a disclaimer on that website and it needs to be prominent. So if I put a PayPal account on my website that I don't pay for? A law no one else has paid for it and there's no other cost. It's cost associated by someone. Okay. That's where it gets into. Uh, also, there is no problem, for example, if you've got thousands of Facebook friends in election day or anytime you want, you're sending out messages to all of them to vote for you and all that, there's no cost involved. There's not a matter of, you know, do I have to put a disclaimer every time I send that out? You know, that's free advertising. Right. Um, and, um, and an email. An email in and of itself, again, is not paid expression. Now, what I always tell candidates that I work with, it doesn't cost you anything to put a disclaimer on an email template, on a Facebook page, on any of the things that we've talked about unless there really isn't room for it. I always encourage people to go ahead and put a disclaimer. It doesn't take up any extra space and it protects you. It protects you from people causing trouble for you in the middle of a campaign. But again, it's not paid expression so it doesn't need to be there. But does need to be on a website. And a free website would probably have, if it's, a, if it's really a blog, then um, it's a blog. And, 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 that, and that's the argument, that it's not a website. Um, text message, Twitter, again, you don't need disclaimer on a Twitter message. Um, and then there are all kinds of other apps and screensavers and everything that the, the disclaimer is not required. Um, this is a lot of legalese, so we've got legal folks in the, and this is straight out of the, straight out of the statute, so we can go on for that. And this also talks about third parties, so for, and this is more legalese. Um, oh, I love the word impractical. That's, that's a great word. But anyway, um, this, do we understand basically where we need disclaimers and where we don't need disclaimers? 
if you have a question about you're putting together an ad, you can call, you can send it to me, you can send it to Jerry. We won't sign off on it because that's not our place to do it, but we will look at it. We'll, we'll make sure that the elements that should be there are there and because we don't want you to go and print a thousand pieces of something. And that goes for signs too. You get excited, you're going to make this purchase, you're going to do it. You want to be sure that you have it. Disclaimer has to be on signs. Okay. So. And the key is, if you've got room, if you put it on there, put it on there if you're saving everyone the aggravation of someone trying to say you're not doing something you're supposed to. And it's also, it's also consistency too. That means that all of your, your message and all the pieces that you're putting together for the campaign are consistent throughout. And that's really, that, that just looks professional and it's good, good practice. Okay, so um, we'll talk about emails, but a campaign website in the traditional sense of a website has cost associated with it, paid expression, it does need, does need that disclaimer there. Endorsements, we get a lot of questions about endorsements and when you're putting your ads together and somebody has said to you, um, you know, I'm really endorsing you, I, I, I'm behind you 100% and it's somebody of, of, of stature in the community, um, you need to have something in writing from that person. And you're going to have it on the file. Yeah, and, and it's really important because and you may know this person on the like and you want to put that as an endorsement. And a lot of people like those ads. They're very effective. All these people who support you and all this kind of stuff. But have it in writing. There's nothing more embarrassing to a candidate than someone comes out and says, I didn't say an endorsement. If he said, well, I've got it in writing. And he said, well, don't you remember we had the conversation? And, I, and I've had where people have, have told me, they, I told both candidates I support them. You know, but I wasn't endorsing, you know. They use terminology of, I, I support you, you know, but I'm not endorsing you. And so the best thing you can do is come up with your own form and say, I, I'm, I'm putting together an ad for the Beaches Leader and, or somewhere, and, and I want to list your name, and if you're okay with it, sign right here, you know, and bam, and then you're covered, and that's the best way there's to do no, it. There's no formal, you can just put a letter yeah. together. Yeah. It's very easy. It's very easy to just have the person fill in, fill in the blanks and, and sign your name. Um, we, don't, we don't verify it. Okay, you don't have to send us a copy. It's really the honor system. But you, what you don't want to do is, if I've had a candidate before, who somebody very prominent had said uh, he was supporting her, and at the very last minute he rescinded, he renounced his endorsement of this candidate. And it was devastating. It was devastating to the candidate. It was, it was an embarrassment. And you don't want to do that. You want to be sure that you're Somebody says they're endorsing you, you've got it in writing. And then if someone says, well, I want to, you can show the paper. I have an endorsement in writing. It used to be a few years ago, and I don't know where they stand now. I remember Shoreline used to be okay with endorsements without having it in writing to see they're in writing. I know Beach's leader at one time used to say, if I'm going to put names, I want you to show me. Because, again, sometimes the papers also don't want to be embarrassed with them call, writing the editorial or calling them up and saying, I never said that, and you printed it. So you may even get some time from media saying, you know, I'd like to see your, your, your list. It's not, it's out of our hands, but it's just up to them if they want to ask for it. I know this may sound bizarre, but sure. last year there was a, an ad in the Beaches Leader from a candidate thanking his supporters, and he listed the supporters, and one of the supporters was deceased. Now, what does that that's a good question because yeah. it's different than an endorsement afterwards and the election's over. Well, no, the election was over. Oh, this is between the primary and the general. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that, that's really working still as an endorsement. Thank you for this. And I'm, that, that should really, it'd be interesting. It's probably a legal question. You're trying to skirt the thing about they endorsed me, but they supported me. Said, and that goes back to that terminology of support endorsement. I think you still fall into the, to the area that it's an endorsement and you should have your signature. And not having that, you know, you can't even assume just because they told you they voted for you that they're endorsing you for the next election. And you're kind of implying that. So again, not trying to get legal advice, but in a sense, we know what the candidate's trying to do, trying to imply that this person also supports me for the next election. And that's a real gray area. And so uh, in those kind of things, I would advise a candidate anytime you run a list of people who support you quote, endorse you, that you ought, to, you, you ought to follow the rule and have them sign that. If they're deceased, that's, you know, 
you, you know, and I, I've seen in the past where someone will say that the wife of someone who's passed away supports me. You know, most of the time people aren't going to draw that conclusion. I you just know, found it really... You know, kind of a little more to do. Yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> and the person's dead. Yeah. Well, the other thing, please be assured, that person did not vote if they were in disease. <laughs> so um, we'll watch out for those too. But those are those areas, you, when you start listing people's names, you really need to have a lot. Okay, third-party voter registration. Um, if you, as a candidate or your supporters, are making their way around a neighborhood and they knock on a door and the individual says, well, you know what, I've just moved here, I'm not registered to vote, and we haven't, the books have not closed yet, registration hasn't closed, you then have kind of a dilemma. Um, you can have, you can go to our website and print out voter applications. You could leave a voter application with that household. They've just moved here, they haven't had a chance to register to vote yet. But what you don't want to do is put yourself in a position where you have the person fill out the application and then you take possession of it, I'll take it to the supervisor of elections office. What you have done is you have you have become a third party voter registration organization. Yeah, and this is a change in state law over the last year or so. And it used to be candidates would love to go out and, say, and introduce themselves and say, oh, and you're not registered, go well, here, let me help you get registered, fill this out, I'll take it back. And then, and obviously in that, in that partnership that you just formed, person's happy, you've got a supporter, you've got them registered, but you can't do that anymore. You can't be that agent picking it up unless you're a state registered third party voter registration organization. The organization can be one person. You can do that and get registered and be able to do that up. But otherwise, what you really want to do is either you can give out applications, don't pick them up, and tell them that our address is on the back, and mail it to us. Uh, you can tell them to go to any public library. They're all voter registration places. You can tell them to call us. We'll do every correspondence with them to tell them you know, download this, or we'll ma we mail registration applications, or, or mail it to us, or do whatever you need to do. But just don't get in that trap unless you're a free PBRO, a third party voter registration organization. You know, uh, picking up application because it is it starts getting into some heavy fines when you do that. And all that got into is that, as we say, no good deed or bad deed goes unpunished. It was groups that used to uh, years ago, and this goes back to in some national organizations and stuff like that, that would go out and get people to register in parking lots and stuff like that, and then they decided which which applications to turn in. And that's why they went to this thing of going. It, and once you're a third party. A voter registration organization, we give you applications, we number those applications. We track them. We know yeah, that they're track. yours, it comes back in. That keeps the, the ones that you read about occasionally where someone turns in Mickey Mouse or turns in somebody else. We know who turned them in. And so all that came back to the state wanted the accountability of groups that were going out to register people. And so because of the ones in the past that did it poorly or did it to kind of prevent some registrations from being counted, that's why there's so much uh, oversight now. So you'll be able to, you can visit our website for information about that if you're so inclined to become a third party. Um, okay, so we've already kind of talked about this. We're going to have our electric, our electronic poll books um, up and running live. That's the plan, live at the four precincts in Atlantic Beach. Therefore, we won't have the paper registers. And what the other thing we'll be doing for the first time is have, um, I don't know how often the files will be. We're going to test it all out. I don't want to say that it's going to be every hour, but we will have the files posted on the website. It'll be a, a text file that'll say everybody who has voted already, and then a text file that will be everybody who has not voted. And our thoughts is, and we've got to obviously verify, but we'd like it to be very up-to-date information. So if we can do it on an hourly basis, it's feasible, that's what we're shooting for. And also just to give you a comfort level, we'll have paper register printed in case the machines all went down. You know, how do you continue conducting the election? You pull out your paper registers and you continue from there. So we'll have a paper backup uh, should there be a problem. But has everybody in here early voted at one time or another? You mentioned the early vote, voting side. You see how it's pretty easy and um, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty efficient. And so that's what we anticipate will be for the future. Um, and so election night. Um, election night, the polls are closed. We will have a scrolling web, the, our website, which Atlantic Beach will be linked to. Our website will have the election results as they're being reported once the polls are closed. Our OSX machines upload the data um, in the machine via modem. DS200. DS200. 
exactly the days of the Yeah, I'm using the wrong phraseology. I'm so sorry. GS 200. Okay. Um, any post-election issues which will come about by um, have to do with provisional ballots. If we have to issue a provisional ballot, and that's because someone does not have their ID or their eligibility to vote could be in question. And then absentee envelopes that we get in the mail that day. Um, any any stragglers that may come into our office at the very end of the day. Those are the kinds of things that we're dealing with at the at the close of the polls. That we will all of the all of the uh, verification um, throughout the day will be done as far as absentee ballots that will come in. And Jerry, you want and then the absentees also. Uh, we will by state law we must report the absentees that we've come in and counted. Uh, before 7.30. We will try to, I'm not going to give you exact time, but it will be probably about a 7.10. What you'll see show up first on the website will be the absentees. Normally it's absentees and early. Those are the two you have to report by 7.30, but we just use an absentees. So do not let it alarm you when you see, let's say there's 600 votes cast in these precincts and it says zero precincts reporting. The reason that is, is that's your absentees. Your precincts reporting is your election day report. And it will come in and it will say 1 and 4, 2 and 4, 3 and 4, and you'll see which precincts have reported. What's really nice about the new equipment that we use, the DS 200s, is they automatically load them in. So as soon as the poll worker puts, there's a sheet that says, I'm ending the election, and they run it through that there's no other ballots to cast, and they close that out, it automatically uploads. What we used to have to wait for is for them to do their accounting, do everything, and then bring. Uh, the, the memory card, you know, into or bring the machine in to upload it. So as soon as that machine, it's a wireless modem, as soon as it's got its instructions that it's counted all the votes, then it automatically wireless goes into our tabulator. And so, you know, based on that, I mean, you know, it would be nice. We'll have election day in, you know, if everything goes right, election day in, hopefully by 745 would be a uh, proper time based on what we've seen in the past using these DS-200s and then also with those absentees. As Beth mentioned, what could be the things that we're waiting for that can even be after 8 o'clock? It's the provisional balance and it's absentees that the canvassing board has to look at. Uh, canvassing board looks at absentees that the signatures are questionable. In other words, the, the way statute says is staff, myself and staff, looks at the signatures. If they match we approve them, they're put in, they're counted, they're counted, we put them up somewhere around 710. But if they're one and we says, this signature doesn't match, then the canvassing board uh, will then look at that with the signatures we have on file and with the vote of at least two members either saying yay or nay, must be a majority, either accepts or rejects, then they will or will not count that. And then after they say we count it, then we give it to them, we, we upload that, and we put that in. Normally, we may have one, two, or three, as I've seen in past land use elections, that we have a signature issues. Then there's provisional ballots. Should we have voters who come and they don't have their ID? They're not refused the right to vote. But again, they're, they go to provisional. If their signature matches on the provisional, we count it that night. But if it doesn't match on the provisional, they have until 5 o'clock on Thursday to bring that in. So technically, you could have a tied race okay, waiting for that voter to bring in their ID by 5 o'clock on Thursday to break that time. That's the, the I don't want to say worst case example, but that is the most prolonged example of what can happen in an election. I say that now, hoping that never happens, but I will say Bay County, in the last, since I've been a supervisor in the last eight years, it had three tied elections. I think Orange Park had one. You know, we have not had a tied election. I don't want one, <laughs> but if it's that close, I just want to let you know there's always that possibility it's not decided on election night because, again, we're waiting to see every vote that is qualified to be counted is counted, and as late as by state law, 5 p.m. Thursday, you could be waiting for a voter to come in to present. If the voter doesn't come in and present the ID, the signature doesn't match, then that provisional ballot isn't counted. If there is a tight race, in case you're wondering what happens there, we haven't had one, but just well know tonight, is that by state law, there will be a, a lottery system where basically uh, we will put um, something in a bag that, you know, whether it be different colored marbles or whatever, and it'll, you 
pick one or the other, and in doing so, you know, that decides the winner. So that's what state law says. So Has that ever been done? Yes, it comes down to that. Who's on the canvassing board? Who's on the canvassing board? And how do you get on there? Well, the canvassing board is made up of your city manager, of your city clerk, and attorney. City attorney. City attorney. Uh, three members of the canvassing board. But people are allowed in. Oh, and that is all in the public. We're going to hold it in the chambers this time because we want a little more room. It's always been tight back there in the conference room. But there will be seats set up. You'll see that that's a public process when they look at signatures or make decisions on the provisional ballots. That's public. And so from that standpoint, that will all be done and conducted. Again, we'll probably open a sheet for whatever the, the chemistry board could have nothing to look at. There could be no provisionals and no absentee signatures to look at. And we conclude it with the, the tally of the election day and the absentee. But if they have anything to look at, we're hoping to start that about 7.30. Uh, that's what we're shooting for at that time to start the canvassing board. Yeah. Good question, Jess. The canvassing board has no citizens on it? Well, uh, when you say no, and, and, and basically your canvassing board uh, doesn't, I mean, from the standpoint of ordinary citizens. And in fact, uh, the canvassing board for gubernatorial elections and presidential elections and the city elections is actually made up of the supervisor elections the a member of the uh, Jacksonville City Council and the county judge. In this case, I'm not going to be a lot happier about that. Well, in some <laughs> cases, that, that may be good or bad, but this is the way, I think, yeah, that good. is established within, I think it was within the charter. They made a charter you know, election to do that. So I am there to advise them of the state laws and things of that nature. And, and again, it's complete oversight. So, And I will say, you know, they never see a ballot. Okay, so they can't determine, well, I'm going to count this one because they voted for this person and that person. We are very, you know, positive that they are making a decision based on just those facts. Yes. This is a question just out of curiosity. When you're talking about a provisional ballot, uh, if that's a different ballot than what a registered voter is given? Now, well, all registered voters are the ones who are voting. Provisional ballot is a ballot that's in limbo because of the question of eligibility. I mean, is it the same ballot? Oh, it's the same physical ballot. It's so just then somebody has to follow that person to make sure that it goes you know. into it goes into a pink envelope. It goes into a pink envelope to seal. Then when it's accepted, we then put it into a machine that we have set up for the provisional. So I mean, somebody watches the person put it. And all that's done in the public. Yeah, the, well, yes. the clerk, the manager, the manager of the precinct. And you at the polling location, the provisional ballot is filled out by the voter, the voter's information, everything on that, is sealed, and then they're given a number and they're given instructions, for example, if they don't have ID that they need to bring it in. And so all that's given there and sealed. And so then it's sealed and it's put in the envelope, and then that precinct manager will then bring those to us to canvas at uh, the, the chambers. I say all this about a close tie race, and I just, yeah. yeah. But it, it does make it exciting, I will say that. So, um, in the third day, um, by noon, we have to have unofficial results. Uh, certification is due on the seventh day by 5 p.m., but usually we know our official results on the Friday of the week of the election. Thursday was the provisionals have to be. Um, ID has to be brought in, so we usually know by Friday, um, and then the following, and then I, I don't. I guess we're going to wait until November to to install. To uh, yeah, and that's all based on the charter. Yeah. The, the other thing is why these dead these dates are so far out. Should there be a recount? Again, what constitutes a recount? If if the vote difference between the two candidates is a half a percent or less. There is a machine recount, which means basically we'll put every ballot from that race, you know, from the election, into another machine and feed every ballot again and see if the count is what it was before. You know, but the recount then stands. If it's within a quarter of a percent, we run them all through the machine, but then we look at every ballot to see the undervotes, which means they didn't vote in a race. Did they actually make some kind of indication for a candidate that wasn't within the oval? Are in some way so light that you couldn't, the machine didn't read it. But really, the canvassing board says, you know, and what, what the statute says, there is a clear indication of the voter's choice. It's not, do you know the intent of the voter? Because you can't read the mind. 
But based on what you're looking at, is there a clear indication of what the voter wanted? You know, and by that, what can happen sometimes, say on an absentee ballot, a voter can, you know, because they're not going to have a place to go ask for another ballot, they made a mistake. And so they, they scratch through, and then they fill in the next oval for that candidate, and then they circle it and say, you know, uh, I want this candidate, you know. And so that's one of those that has to be remade in front of the canvassing board and counted, you know, for which way they think there's a clear intent of what voted want. So again, those are some of the things the canvassing board will do. Those are some of the reasons that during a recount that you're looking at those under and over votes to determine in any way was there something marked on that ballot that should be counted because there's a clear indication of what the voter wanted, but the machine didn't read it. So that's a quarter of a percent, half of a percent. You don't look at the over and unders. You just look at whatever you need to the machine. So we have done recounts. We just haven't had a time race yet. I say that. Some of you all have heard about um, some of the changes in the law. The good thing is, it doesn't affect Atlantic Beach. We'll be done with the election. The election will be finished officially. Um, but there, there are quite a few things that have changed. Um, I just. I put some highlights on here, just some things that, that pertain to uh, campaign finance. Uh, you may have heard of uh, committees of continuous existence um, as an entity are going away. They're going to cease to exist as of September. Um, and, uh, and probably the best thing is just to remember that in case you hear somebody say, well, I hear the law changed. You know, you can go back to this slide and look at your hand out and go, yeah, but it's not effective until 11. And it doesn't That's what we want to say. Right. And we don't have any CCEs here locally. They're all managed in Tallahassee, so that's a good thing. Um, campaign reporting is going to change. It's going to go from a quarterly to a monthly. Um, so y'all, Atlantic Beach got in right underneath that one, because that, that is a significant change. And campaign contributions are going up. Um, for county and municipal candidates after November 1st, again, up to $1,000 per election cycle per contributor. So it jumps as from 500 as a max, which goes from 500 to 1,000. On the, on the gubernatorial level, it's 3,000. Candidates Statewide three candidates now. is 3,000. Um, you can, you know, we can all probably have have uh, opinions about what we think about that, but anyway, that's what but that's new stuff. And there's all kinds of other new things that will be coming online uh, after the first of, of uh, November. So that's really, I, but I just wanted you to have kind of those highlights to know what you're missing. But anyway, are there any other questions, burning things that you want to know about and you've never, you've never asked before? You guys have asked some great questions. I think you're all ready, you know? So. Very well informed. Uh, please feel free to, to call Supervisor Holland, call me, email us. This chair is the only, I always tell the story, is the only um, constitutional officer that I'm aware of that uh, publishes his, his number and he answers his phone and returns his messages. If I don't answer, I will call you back. Right here. Yes. Right here. Yes. 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 Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> the demographic. Or the data y'all had talked about earlier. Yes. How is that available? Is email, that available? Me. email me. It's it's all we send it all electronically. There's no. Are you on email? Do you yeah. use the internet? Just email Beth email, and request email what you need, and she can electronically send you that information. Carol, or if you Carol want it in maps, we can, can we can do it right. in map forms. We can do it in many different forms. And, and if there's anything that involves the cost, we'll tell you prior to to producing anything. Generally, if it's electronic, there's no charge. Yeah. There's lots of fun stuff. Lots of fun stuff. Yeah. Well, thank you all so much for coming tonight. We really appreciate your, your attentiveness and your questions. And uh, please feel free to call us if you have any questions or concerns. And thank you, Jerry and Beth, for, for doing this presentation tonight. We really appreciate it. It's always, always very informative. I learn something every time I come. And we've been doing this for how many years? Yeah. Um, so just a quick reminder, I want to clarify some things because of some of the things that, that was mentioned. Um, Beaches Watch is nonpartisan. So our candidate form is a nonpartisan candidate form, and we invite all the candidates to come. All the candidates will be hopefully coming. Uh, 
Um, we do not endorse candidates either. Um, our organization never has. And um, so don't ever, if you ever see anything that says a candidate's endorsed by Beaches Watch, that's wrong. So anyway, just want to make sure that everybody understands that. Um, before you leave tonight for the candidates, make sure on that sign-in sheet you give us your contact information, the phone number that's the best number to reach you, and the email address that's the best email address to reach you so that we can get in touch with you as we are doing preparations for the forum. And um, again, mark your calendars because the forum will be Wednesday, August 14th at 7 o'clock at the Atlantic Beach Elementary School. And uh, I think most of you probably have my email address and uh, you'll be hearing from me uh, because we have more fun things in store for you between now and the 14th. But uh, thank you all for coming tonight. And um, remember, July 10th is our next Beaches Watch meeting and it's the meeting uh, it's uh, Beaches Budgets 101, and it should be a really good meeting. And it's going to be at Neptune Beach City Hall, not here because we couldn't get this room for that meeting. So um, have a good night. Thank you all for coming. Thanks,